Good evening and welcome again um, to our study in, in the book of Colossians. This is session four. We're going to be looking at Colossians 1, verses 9 to 11. This is Paul's prayer of intercession. Before we begin, let's pray. Father, as we come to your word again this evening, we ask that you would open our lives to it. We ask that you'd open our understanding. We ask you for your wisdom. We ask you for insight for living. Lord, we ask that you would um, disarm in us anything that would be resistant to your truth. A stuff in us that always reacts to places where we need you to change, Lord. And we need your help, the gift of repentance, the power of your spirit, Lord, to follow you. We ask your blessing, Lord, on all those who are listening. Ask your help, Lord God, in teaching. And in all, Lord Jesus, glorify yourself, we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Let's read together uh, Colossians 1, verses 9 through 11. Paul writes, So, in light of all God's done, we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord. And your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. We also pray that you will be strengthened with all his glorious power. So you will have all the patience and endurance you need with joy. Now, just to recap, remember, Paul is in prison in Rome because of the gospel. He had never met the believers in Colossae. Epaphras, who was a convert of his ministry, was the apostolic church planner of this particular congregation. Uh, he had come to Paul in Rome for help. Uh, he had filled in Paul about the battle against the heresy that was trying to infiltrate this local church. This church was being threatened at its very roots because Jesus' identity and his work of redemption were being called into question by false teaching, by humanly devised philosophy, and also by religious legalism. Paul's call and anointing was not only to proclaim the gospel, but to defend it. He had only two options. He had the option to, let, to write a letter of encouragement to strengthen their faith and to pray. And so he did both in the power of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> in light of all that Paul had heard because of their, their faith in Christ Jesus, his, 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 his first few verses, he's rejoicing in that faith, their love for all the saints, because he knew that they were united to Christ Jesus and were wanting to follow Jesus with their whole lives, Paul interceded for them. He had three main requests of God for these believers. First, he prayed that the Colossians would know and be filled with the will of God. Second, that the believers would walk, would live a life that was worthy of Christ Jesus, and that they would also be filled with the power of God in order to do his will, to live their new life in Christ with endurance, and with patience and with joy. First, he prayed that the Colossians know and be filled with the will of God. We ask that God give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Paul's first request is that they know God's will. He was asking that they be filled with the knowledge of God's will. This is more than just head knowledge. This is more than just cataloging stuff. It's more than a generalized notion of the will of God. The picture here is Paul is asking that they be saturated and soaked in the will of God, very much like a sponge dropped into fluid until it's completely full. It was not just to knowing about the will of God. It was to have one whole, one's whole being permeated by the will of God. Paul was asking that they be so filled with the will of God that what flowed through them and out of them would be shaped and molded by the will of God itself. So that in some ways, if you wanted to see what God's will was, you could look at the church at Colossae and watch them and you would know. Just like Jesus had said to his disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And then he says to his disciples, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. The world is going to be able to look at you and to see what the will of the Father is. Paul was talking about the whole scope of life. It would have absolutely been stupid to Paul to think that someone would compartmentalize their life in the segments as, as, as say, as secular and, and religious. It was the whole of life that was encompassed by life in Christ. The message of the gospel was to the 
whole person, the whole of their life, every relationship, every dimension of daily living was to be filled with and affected by the life of Jesus being lived in them in the power of the Holy Spirit. The will of God touches all of life. What we do, what we say, what we think. Paul is praying that the more and more their lives are filled and motivated and empowered by the will of God, that it be evident to everyone around them. God has a will for us in Christ Jesus, and he wants us to know it. He didn't want to hide it. He wants us to know it, to live it, and to experience the richness being of being vitally connected with God himself, eternally connected with God himself. We are meant to know that life and to grow in that life and to be filled with the knowledge of that life. Paul wants the believers in Colossae to be informed, intelligent believers for their faith to have substance and for their belief to be filled with meaning and reason. It's not just a religious thing. It's not like some sort of metaphysical lapel pin they were supposed to wear. It was meant to be a way of living. The knowledge of God's will is the foundation of all Christian character and conduct. It is a knowledge that both grasps and penetrates into the object of that knowledge itself, which is God. Paul is praying for them to be filled, saturated with the Lord himself. The will of God expresses the person of God. It gives deeper insight and causes us to see more clearly the connection God has given to us in making us heirs of the kingdom of God in Christ Jesus. Paul is praying for the church, for the perfection, for the deep and accurate comprehension that comes from knowing the will of God. It's an intimate knowing. It's not some sort of windy speculation, but it's true knowledge. And such knowledge was meant to pervade one's whole being, your thoughts, your affections, your purposes, your plans, your decisions and actions, all of life. Such insight for living uh, is meant to work powerful change in us and to liberate us from deception, from compromise. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 states, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Because the reality is anything that is contrary to the will of God is not going to, to work and, and, and to bring about human flourishing. It's not going to cause life to be whole and complete. It's not going to fill us up. It's not going to be what God intends for us to be. The point is this. God tells us what makes for life and how we're to live. And what he tells us is his will. Therefore, it makes logical sense to study what he said. We must study God's word if we're going to know the whole purpose of God, even in a broad sense. Paul is asking that they know God's will specifically, his intention for Christian conduct in every arena of life. In other words, if we live in accordance with God's will, our lives will demonstrate that will in God's power. The fact is, God, whatever God asks us to do, he empowers us to do. God will never, ever, ever ask of us something that he does not empower us to do. And when the knowledge of God's will floods our lives, then it flows out of us into conduct and behavior. Matthew 6, 10, Jesus prays, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's the intention for God's kingdom in us. Jesus in John 4, 34 says, my food, Jesus says, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. In Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, Paul says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies, your whole selves, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and to prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. 1 John chapter 2, verse 17, the world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. And then in Psalm 143, 10, the psalmist says, teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. God's will is practical. It requires trust, a faith that will respond in active belief 
in obedience. You can you can you can measure my my faith by my obedience. If I'm doing what the Lord says, you will. It, it's interesting. Someone once said years ago that if if in, in the first century God spoke to a Hebrew and God spoke to a Greek, you could tell what God's will God God has said to the Hebrew by what He was doing. The Greek would hold a seminar on it. Our tendency is to is to do that. The seminar thing. I've got the information down, as opposed to no, it flows into us and it changes conduct and behavior. It's practical, regardless of the cost, because we believe God. Lord, I believe you. I believe what you say is true. This will make for life. That won't. It's inconvenient for me, Lord God. Everything in me is wanting. But I'm going to trust you that your will is the way of life and wholeness and peace. But you have to know it before you can do it. You have to know the Lord himself and his power to be able to accomplish his will. We need to know God's will in general and in principle so as to be able to apply it to particular situations and to have it in mind in dealing with emergencies. There are certain things that we don't have to pray about. I don't need to pray about if, if I was an unmarried man and I, and I was dating a girl, I would not need to pray about whether or not the Lord wanted me to move in and, 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 and be sexually intimate with her before marriage. I would have to pray about that because God's word is very clear that that's not his plan. That is not his way. Is God trying to deny me something? No, God's trying to protect me from something. In fact, uh, Father David Green and I were talking before the, the broadcast tonight, and there was, was a lady who's done research, and she's a Jewish woman who really has no orientation toward faith one way or the other, but she looked statistically. She said someone, a couple who lives together prior to marriage, prior to, to the, the commitment to holy matrimony, have only a 22% chance of their marriage lasting. She said, if you're going to get married, don't live together. And this was, this was her assessment. God knows what he's talking about when he puts parameters. God's Knowing God's will involves both wisdom and understanding. God's will comes to us, becomes part of us through spiritual wisdom and understanding. God wants us to seek him out. He longs for a real, vibrant relationship and communication, ongoing, ever-increasing intimacy with him. He wants to give to us wisdom and understanding. The word wisdom is so so Sophia means a person who knows the first principles or basic principles of life, knowing how to put one foot in front of the other. Understanding means that person has the ability to apply the basic principles of everyday life to the circumstances and decisions of life. Having wisdom, knowing it, understanding how to apply it. <clears throat> Verse 9, Paul says, we ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Well, how do we re receive this wisdom and understanding. But it doesn't come from us. It comes from God. It's his gift, and he's made a way for us to receive it. So where can we go to receive it? First, we study his word. We study his word to know his will. We rely upon the Holy Spirit to open God's word to us and to make it come alive, to make it become flesh and blood to us, to apply it to us practically. That's why Paul says to Timothy and to others, preach the word, preach the word, read from the scriptures. Let your congregation see and understand what God is saying, expressing his will. John 20, 31, John writes, but these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. These things are written for us to read and mark and inwardly digest or becomes part of us. Paul in Acts 20, 32 writes, Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Romans 15, 4 reads, For everything was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. 1 Peter 1.22 Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have a sincere love for each other, Love one another deeply from the heart. In 1 Peter 2, verse 2, like newborn babes crave pure spiritual milk, 
so that by you may grow up in your salvation. So studying the word. You want to know God's will? I need to begin his word. Secondly, always in conjunction with studying God's word is praying through his word. We ask God for insight and application. Holy Spirit, when I come to study scripture, I'll open up the word as I'm studying or reading you for devotion or, or for study or preparation. Say, Lord, open my heart. Teach me, Holy Spirit. Jesus said the Holy Spirit would take his things and make them real to us, would lead us and guide us into all truth. So in praying the word, the Holy Spirit gives insight for application. Ephesians 1:17, Paul writes, I keep asking that that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, will give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you might know him better. Let the word of God come alive. James 1.5, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. God is not stingy with, with giving understanding and giving insight. He wants us to live. He wants to make it come alive. The kind of life God wants us to live is anything but boring. It's life. It's life's ultimate adventure in discovering the very purpose and destiny for which we were born. The world has all these distractions out there to keep us distracted, not think deeply about our lives. Keep us always so busy that we're just thinking on a superficial level. But without knowledge of God's will and purpose on the earth and without the wisdom to see it and the understanding to apply it, life will be exceptionally shallow for too many people the scope of their life is about as deep as a plate it's visceral it's surface the truth not being relative truth is grounded in jesus christ and him alone first corinthians chapter 1 verses 21 through 24 paul writes for since in the wisdom of god the world through its wisdom did not know him god was pleased through the foolishness of what we preach to save those who believe Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. John 16, verses 12 through 15, Jesus says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own he will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said, the Spirit will receive from me, and he will make it known to you. Insight into God's will is never just an end in itself. It's not, oh, great, now I know. It's when you know it, you're meant to grow in it. Peter in his second letter, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 writes, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and the Savior Jesus Christ. Grow in it. To him be glory, both now and forever. Paul's second request was that the believers, in knowing the will of God, would then live a life that was worthy of Jesus Christ. He was praying that they would walk the talk, that they would do what they say. Knowledge of the Lord's will comes through spiritual wisdom and understanding, but it's never an end in itself. <clears throat> Verse 10, then when you know the knowledge of God's will, when you're saturated and soaked in it, it becomes a part of you. You will live always in a way that honors and pleases the Lord. Your life will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. When there is knowledge of God's will, where there's wisdom and understanding to apply it by the Holy Spirit, it gives birth to obedience. The Lord enables us to live a truly good life, to show who we are by how we live. You know, a tree is identified by its fruit. To live a life worthy of the Lord, literally to walk, the word in Greek is to walk, the outward expression of one's inner self, one's inner life, integrity. It means to set one's life, one's behavior and conduct after Christ. It's like your compass is set and you follow the course. Because it's not enough just to know the will of God. It's not enough to possess the wisdom, to possess the basic principles of life. It's not even enough to possess understanding, the ability to apply those basic principles to everyday life. Knowing the will of God is actually of no value until we've committed our lives to actually doing it. Knowing something and having the ability to do something are very important. 
without the ability to do it, it's just head knowledge. Without the will to do it, it's just head knowledge. The critical point is putting into practice what we know. We are to live out the will of God, to practice and to do the will of God, committing our lives to it and to grow in it. This is there's not an expectation on Paul that somehow there's a there's a there's a, 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 a moment in time where there's a, a zapping and all of a sudden, woo, I've got it all, I know it down, I've got it perfectly now. It's a growing. And the more you grow in that understanding, the more you recognize your dependency upon the Lord. Not more not independent, but more dependency and drawing from him. To live a life worthy of the Lord, it means literally that this is a life that's commiserate with what the Lord has done for us and what he is to us. The life worthy of the Lord is a life in conformity with our union with Jesus Christ and with his purposes for our lives. It's a life that reflects the relationship we stand in with him as well as the profession we make from him. There's integrity in what we say and what we do match. Our walk is to weigh as much as the walk of Jesus. Our conduct is to conform to the will of God as much as Jesus' conduct conformed to the will of God. Kind of heavy, isn't it? We're to live a life as worthy as the life Jesus lived. The will of God is to control our behavior as much as it did the behavior of Jesus. That's where we're moving. That's what Paul's praying for this. These young, young believers, this brand new church. <clears throat> that they would grow in full measure, to measured by the maturity that belongs to Jesus. Jesus is the pattern, and we're the copy. The copy is to match the pattern. Father David Green has, has a business where they make all kinds of incredible boxes and, and intricate things that fit together. You have a pattern, and the pattern and the copies are supposed to match. You have a pattern, things are built on it, it cuts it out, and it's exactly like the pattern. The copies are there. Or as John states in 1 John 1, 6, Whoever claims to live in him, in Christ Jesus, must live as Jesus did. Wow. So what does that look like? Well, first, Paul says, your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. You look at Jesus' life and is the goodness of, of the life of the Father flowing out of him. He's setting the captives free. He's making the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the lame to walk, the, the, the spiritually demon-possessed are being set free. People are raised from the dead. <clears throat> There's life being given, forgiveness being given, hope being given, healing being given. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, meekness, gentleness, and self-control. It's the Lord's own character that will be developed and reproduced in those who know the will of God and submit their wills to the doing of it, trusting in the power of the Holy Spirit to live it, to have both insight for living and the power to put into practice what they know to be true. The Holy Spirit enables this in the life of every believer. Well, that's just for, you know, <clears throat> that's just for, you know, special saints, you know, those guys out there who, who have the Bible memorized and, uh, you know, I'm just going to church every Sunday and, no, 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 no. This is for everyone who's following Jesus, every single person. Being fruitful in every good work means that we are going to be doing every good work. God's will entails goodness to flow from us. You know, if I ask my son to take out the trash, and we have, and I mean, all three trash cans, and he only takes out one, he actually hadn't taken out the trash. Doing every good work and bearing fruit in it doesn't mean doing half of what God asks us, but all. When we're living his will, it is pleasing the Lord. It's an attitude of heart and mind. It's one that anticipates his wish, is attentive to his voice, informed by his word, and comes with a fixed attention to him. Lord, what would you have me do in this situation? How would you have me be? You know, Lord Jesus, what would you do? Matthew, uh, Jesus says in Matthew 5, 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your fathers in heaven. Your father in heaven, Hebrews 10, 24. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Good words will not do without good works. The claim to know God will demonstrate itself in doing what God is doing. Jesus said, I only do what I see my father doing. I only say what I hear my father saying. And I hear his call upon us as the church. When he says, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. We're to hear 
what the Father is, is saying, and, and that's what we're to say. We're to see what the Father is doing, and that's what we're to do. The mercy of God, uh, the grace of God, the power of God, the, the holiness of God, the, the forgiveness of God, um, the consistency of God. James 2, 17 through 18 says, in the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. Someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. See, fruitfulness is never nebulous. It's not some sort of just a spiritual airy-fairy idea. An apple tree doesn't, doesn't produce, it doesn't, doesn't sort of produce apples. Either it produces apples or it doesn't produce apples. If it doesn't produce apples, it's not an apple tree. This fruitfulness is not nebulous. God's character is going to look in a certain way. Every good work, he says, some are easy, some are hard. Some are suitable, some are stretching. Some are safe, some are costly and dangerous. But every good work of God, his heart and his will in the world. Fruitfulness is a regular and uniform regard for God's will, whether it seems to be convenient or not. Second, a life worthy of the Lord is a life that is growing in the knowledge of God. Paul writes in Colossians 1.10, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of the Lord. Growing in the knowledge of the Lord is a twofold process. We grow in the knowledge of the Lord and we grow through the knowledge of the Lord. In the knowledge of the Lord, there's insight. Through the knowledge of the Lord, there's obedience to that insight. When I'm obedient to what God does, it opens my heart to understand him more. As we're obedient to do God's will and God's power, we find in relation to him a spiritual enlargement, a greater capacity to understand and a greater capacity to trust because we've seen him act. Luke 19, 17, Jesus is giving in one of his parables. Well done, my good servant, the master replied, because you've been trustworthy in a very small matter. Take charge of 10 cities. In Mark 4, 23 through 25, Jesus says, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Then he added, Play, pay close attention to what you hear. Pay close attention to what you hear. The, the closer you listen, the more understanding you will be given and the more you will receive, even more. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given. But for those who aren't listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. You see, and to the Hebrew mind, to hear meant to do. Hearing and doing went hand in hand always. When you hear, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord, is one to hear meant to do. And Jesus said, if you've got ears to hear, then hear. It's not just the, oh, I hear my, my tympanic, tympanic membranes in my ear. Ears are picking up the, the vibrations and I understand your words. It's receiving it in order to do it. The investment of obedience to do what we do know allows the Lord to teach us and guide us more. The more my hands are open, the more they can be filled. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, we don't seem to hear what the Lord is trying to say now because we haven't bothered to do what he has already said before. And there have been times in my life when I felt just kind of, well, Lord, I, I, I read your word and, and there's the application, but what do you say in terms of guidance for the next steps in my life? In ministry, what is it? And if there's a silence, I go back. Say, Lord, is there something you said to me before that I missed or that I, 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 I just neglected? And I've had the Holy Spirit lead me back. Sometimes it's in a journal. Sometimes it's just it comes back in the memory. But the Lord reminded me when he spoke to me about a certain thing that I neglected. The minute I apply my heart to that and trust his power to do what he said, I found the doors open up and there's greater insight and understanding. The greater the fruitful obedience to doing the works of the Father, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk in humility with him, the greater the increase of the knowledge of him. There's growth and there's maturity. The question can remain, how do I grow in my knowledge of the Lord? How do I gain personal knowledge and relationship with him? Well, we don't know God because we just know about him. <clears throat> 
Knowing the word of God, even by memory, doesn't mean that we know God himself, not in a personal and intimate way. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you search the scriptures. They had to memorize chapter and verse, the law, the prophet, and the psalm, memorize. He says, but they bear witness to me. You have all this knowledge, but no relationship at all. The way we get to know the Lord is the same way we get to know anyone. You spend time together with him. You're spending time in his word. You're asking, what does this mean? How does it apply? We associate with him. We associate with those who know him. We share with him. We're, we're sharing all the details of our life. We're not being religious in our times of prayer. Our life becomes a, a, an ongoing communion with him in situations and circumstances, driving in the car, brushing your teeth, taking a shower, wherever you are in every sort of situation, your heart is turned toward him for insight, sharing with him, listening to him, fellowship with, fellowshipping him, the sense of walking with him, that your life is lived in reference to him, to know, to go, and to grow with the knowledge of God's will and with the wisdom to apply it with understanding, we can live obedient lives by his grace. Obedient lives are active and they're fruitful. And fruitful lives are progressing and maturing lives. Growth comes through habitual action. Hearts are opened by learning to rely on, trust in, and follow the Lord. There's growth through firsthand experience of the knowledge of God. Rain and sun are to plant growth as the knowledge of God's will and obedience are to spiritual maturity. Firsthand experience shows us that we're not sufficient in ourselves to think of as anything good coming from ourselves. We need the Lord. You know what? I think we're going to have to wait to finish these last verses till next time. Um, because I don't want to wear you out <laughs> with too much stuff. Let's pray. Father, we want to know your will. We want to know you. We want your will to saturate our lives, to inform our behavior. We want you to empower us to be obedient to you. We want, Lord God, the gift of repentance where we're wrongheaded, where our thoughts need to be renewed. Change them, Lord. Change us. Because we want the world to be able to see who you are as you live your life through us. Lord, bless your word to your people. In Jesus' name, amen.